Good morning, this is Dr. Ara Duke Majan, CEO and founder of the Duke Spine Institute. We are here located near Orlando, Florida. Today we're gonna be live streaming spine surgery as we do every week. And our surgery, first surgery for today is a Duke laser disc repair. What is a Duke laser disc repair? Well, it's an advanced revolutionary type of spine surgery done endoscopically and it's done with a minimal incision, virtually no trauma at all to the body, no bleeding, and no pain. Patients take Tylenol and a muscle relaxer after surgery for about a day. And we're gonna go in and we're gonna repair two damaged discs. We call the damage a herniation or disc bulge, it's all the same thing. It's basically a tear in the outer wall of the disc with some of the jelly seeping out. And this patient, if um, she wanted to get rid of her back pain before the Duke laser disc repair was available, she would have to have a fusion done. Fusion surgery involves big incisions, bloody, painful, lots of damage to the spine and surrounding soft tissues, scar tissue, and fusing bones at joints that were not meant to be fused. But she's chosen a non-fusion alternative, which is the very best to repair a herniated disc that causes pain. And that's what we'll be doing today. I'm going to talk to her right now and let her know I'm here. It's Dr. Duke Majin. We're going to get started, okay? All right, now her family is watching, and she wanted me to, to do a big shout out to them. And they're watching through Facebook. Okay? We ready to get started? Blood pressure looks good. I like my systolic pressure around 100. To 110 max. Dr. Duke here, we're going to get started. Just lay still, okay? First thing we're going to do is a little injection of some local, and that's to numb the skin up. That will help her with some of the discomfort of making the small incision, albeit it's only seven millimeters or quarter inch incision in the skin. We should be able to fix both discs with that one incision. So I'm giving her a nice wide field of numbing. And once again, we're fixing L45 and L5S1 disc. We've injected six cc's of local. All right, so we know that she has a, her back pain is coming from herniated disc at L45 and L5S1 because number one, her physical exam, that's where she pointed to. Her pain is the worst at L45 and L5S1 around the belt line. Number two, we got the MRI which shows herniated discs which are slightly degenerated as well, so they'd be herniated, degenerated disc bulges at L45, L5, S1. So those are the two discs we're gonna target. We're gonna get started, okay? Now, I have to navigate down to her, her, her damaged discs, and to do that, I'm gonna use an x-ray picture, lateral. So to navigate, and what navigation means is basically to guide a trajectory or path that goes from one place to another, okay? And for navigational purposes, we're gonna use the x-ray machine. X-ray machine is, in my opinion, the very best way to navigate through the spine. We need to drop the table a smidgen, about a quarter inch. All right, Jordan, let's see if we can't get 5-1 lined up. We're going to start with L5-S1. And before I go any further, I really want to get the spine lined up. Now, the spine is a three-dimensional structure. You're going to need to wag a little bit, I think. The spine is a three-dimensional structure sitting kind of in the middle of, of the body almost, just a little bit posterior towards the skin in the back. But what I have to do here is I have to line... Um, line the bones up properly so that we're getting a true lateral. I don't think that's a true lateral. I know the pedicle looks pretty good, but it looks like the end plate of five at the bottom, the bottom end plate of five, inferior end plate of five is not lined up. Yeah, keep working on it. So while Jordan is working on getting us lined up, if you don't line up properly through the spine, and you're at an angle, then your um, trajectory or path that you think is good is actually could be very bad. You could be way off target. Um, 
Just think about holding a laser at night in your hand and pointing it at, um, pointing it at a star, okay? That's what we have to do. We have a starting point, which is my hand where I'm holding the laser beam, so the origin, and then we have a destination, which is the star. And if you move your hand just so slightly, so slightly, like literally a degree uh, or less than a degree to one side or the other of the star, your laser is not gonna hit the star. Okay, so the, the further the distance from the origin to the destination, the more, um, basically the more accurate or precise you really need to be with your trajectory. And so the origin here is the skin on the back where we enter with our spinal needle. The destination is the annular tear on the right side, posteriorly in the foramen, right where the herniation is. So you can just call it the herniation. Now, many people have herniations on both sides of the spine. We target painful herniations one side or the other, and some people it could be both. So it's my job to figure out where, which herniation, right or left, is actually the cause of the patient's pain. And the way you can figure that out usually is by looking at their leg pain. If the leg pain is on the right side, then it's the right-sided tear and herniation at that disc that you have to be most concerned about. All right, so we even have a little spondylolisthesis at L45. So we have, as her diagnosis, herniated disc, bulging disc, spondylolisthesis, uh, spondylosis, which is a collapsing, degenerating of the disc, and obviously discogenic back pain, annular tears. I think that looks good for 4.5, but we're not doing 4.5. In 4.5, we have some orbital issues as well. So let's get focused back at 5.1. Um, Jordan, it's not too bad. Let's just play with the wag a little bit. Let me release it for me and let me look at it. Shot. That looks worse. Shot. Shot. I'm looking at the pedicles of five. Shot. Does that look better? Huh? Anybody agree with me on that? I still think we have an orbital issue. So why don't you um, bring the base south? Good. Release the wag shot. 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 Better or worse? It looks better, right? Does it? Am I imagining it? It kind of looks better to me. Let's try that and let's play with the orbit a little bit. Lock the wag and let's play with the orbit. Just give me a degree one way or the other. Let's see if we can improve it. Uh, I think that looks worse, right? Let's try it the other way. So why, why is it not easy to line the floor up with the spine? Uh, a little more. You can see the back of the L5 vertebral body has uh, got a double shadow there. I don't know, maybe more? I think that's worse. Yeah, try to go back a little bit. Huh? It looks better, but I just feel like it's still not quite there. Give me a degree, one way or the other, just a degree. Uh huh. I think you're somewhere between the last position and this position, maybe. Try to go back half a degree. Let's just try that and see what happens. Hmm. I don't know, Jordan, any ideas? Luis? So while we're playing with this just for another minute here, why am I taking so much time with lining the fluoroscopy unit up with the spine? I don't know. I think that's worse. 
The reason is simple. If you don't line things up properly, you will be way off from where you think you are. And you don't want to go somewhere you're not supposed to go with that needle. And what follows the needle are far worse instruments, bigger. So I have to get this right. So that's why we're taking our time. And why would the spine be so difficult to line up? Basically because um, there's an element of scoliosis or twisting between the pelvis, the sacrum, and the spine itself, L5. And that twisting or rotation can throw things off. I don't think that's great. Ah, actually, that may be the best we've seen so far. So let's see if we can work with that. Lock it down. I'm going to have to start a little bit lower than where I was. I should still be local there. I'm not sure why there wouldn't be. You okay? Dr. Duke Majin here. You're doing great. We're just getting everything set so that we can do this thing perfect for you. Um, you're going to be awake for the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes until we get to where we need to go. I need your assistance, okay? Sean? So I'm aiming for the L5S1 for Amen. And if it's uncomfortable, let me know. I'll give you a little more numbing medicine. Okay? And that should make you feel better. Now, we can't use any numbing medicine down by the nerve root, but we're not at the nerve root. That's just some numbing medicine. So you want to avoid any numbing around the foramen, which we're close, but not quite there yet. You're doing great. Just lay still, okay? Sean, our trajectory looks pretty good. I've just got to figure out if we're too lateral. Sean? Probably want to be a little bit more north. Sean? All right, we're getting close. Sean? Now let's get an AP view. So on the AP view, which is the front back view, it's going to give me a better idea of how close I am to the back of the disc. So we use at least two views, lateral, which is from the side, and AP, to create a three-dimensional image in my brain as to where we are with the needle tip. All right, so I think we're too far lateral. Let's go back. Well, hold on a second. Blood pressure's good, yeah. You're fine, just lay still. Lateral. That AP, by the way, is off. You can see the spinous process. So you can see there's some twisting of her spine. You all see that on that AP view we just shot? It's going off to the right. It's got a curvature to the right. And of course, that's not what we're here to fix today. We're not going to fix scoliosis today. Shot? 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 Just lay still. You're doing really good. I'm up against facet probably or the back of the disc. Where do you feel that? AP? What'd she say? In her back? We don't want her feeling anything going down her leg. That's the key. All right, so we're still lateral. We're still too lateral. She's, uh, she, her spine, is unlike some of the other spines we've done recently, is very posterior, lateral. It's located back towards her skin. That's the best way to say it. So it's closer to the surface of her body back here. Whereas the last patient we did on Tuesday, his spine was very anterior, way far away from where we are. Hers is very posterior. So the opposite. So if you watch the that patient I did on Tuesday, where do you feel it? Okay, you're doing great, Sean. We're really close to where we need to be. Sean. 
you want. All right, let's go with an AP. So the last patient we did on Tuesday, his spine was super anterior towards the front of his belly button, towards the floor, and the angle that I had to go in was massively different. All right, that's looking better. Really good, actually. So we're right where the pedicle is of five and just at the lateral border of the pedicle. Let's go back to a lateral view. This will be nice. This will be a nice trajectory, a nice angle, and a nice destination, which is the annular tear. Now, if you didn't get a chance to watch the surgery I did, um, the fusion, you should try to watch it. All right, let's just play with some wag for a second. I just want to be a thousand percent sure of where we are. It's kind of hard to tell with the scoliosis. I think we're going to end up coming right back here, but let's just wag a degree north, see if it makes it any better before we go into the foramen. I feel like that's a little better with the pedicle at least. I'm happy with that. You okay? All right. You're doing great, by the way. Hmm. Sean? Let's kill this light up here. Her 5.1 is not that collapsed on the MRI. There we go. Do you feel it in your back? Uh-huh. You do? Yeah. But not down your leg. Shot. So we're right at near the back of the disc. Where do you feel that? Oh, okay, not down your leg. Yeah. And that's where we are, Jordan, right there. Shot. Yeah, you're doing fine. We're almost done with this disc. Very close. Sean? I almost feel like we have to change the arc. Why don't we come further south just to line it up better? Okay. That looks pretty good on the lateral view. Sean? 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 Give me an AP. I must be hitting the facade. Yeah, that's what it looks like. All right, back to a lateral. You're doing great, by the way. Everything's going well. This is the hardest one to access, the L5-S1. We're very close, and I want to make sure we get it just right. Shot? Shot? Where do you feel that? 
Uh huh. Right where your back, your your disc problem is. You feel it in your lower back there. Yes. Yeah. Where do you feel that back? back. Yeah. All right. Well, you did good. Okay, you did real good. Sorry about that. You okay? Yeah, you did good. So that, that's the first one. Clearly that's going to be one of your bad discs, okay? So now that we have the L5S1 accessed, we have an entry point or origin, and we have a destination. So we've connected the origin, which is here where I'm working, to the destination. Now, if you watch the surgery I did Tuesday, uh, the fusion, we literally opened the patient's back from here to here, this whole incision, just to fix three discs, okay? And the whole first two hours of the surgery was just getting down to the spine. We call that the access. This has taken five minutes, maybe 10 minutes by the time I do both. And if you watch that fusion, remember we made a big cut in the skin dissected all the tissue, moved it over, peeled the muscles off the spine. We're not doing any of that with the laser surgery. That's one of the reasons it's so much better surgery. We got to get to four five and line that up, please. You're doing great, okay? I'm just talking. You're going to get to watch this when you're done, and you'll go back and say, okay, really cool. Come on, Jordan. Come on. You should be more north, okay? The only reason you're this far south is because of the scoliosis at five one. Your brain should say, all right, we need to be a little more north and your orbit is off. You're way too orbited. No, that's better. You're almost there. A little bit more, maybe a degree. All right, well, it didn't seem to improve it. Try a little more or a little less. Go one way, then the other. To see if we can make it better. I think that's worse. Let's go back. Mac Moore. All right, I think that's probably the best we're going to get right there, okay? Uh, what do you think, Luis? The spine at L5S1, the relationship? Keep going, Jordan, until you get it right. Huh? All right, so it's neutral is clearly, in my opinion, not right. Let's go, the, keep going and see what happens. Just keep playing with it until you get it right. So the um, rotation or relationship is the best word. The relationship of L5 bone to S1 is going to be different than the relationship of L4 to L5. Ah. I think that's worse, a little worse, because now we're looking down the facet joint of th three, four. That's better. So, <clears throat> Diego, let's turn the light back on for a moment. And can you see my hands shot? Yes, I can see your hands. Jordan, come on. Come on. I think you got a wag issue. Diego, you see my hands here? I do. All right, so this is one vertebrae. Here's the other vertebrae. And we're going for the, the disc or cushion between. Everyone sees models of the spine. They're perfectly lined up. If that was the way it was for every patient, this procedure would be easy. The problem is that the spine rotates, okay? It's called scoliosis. When you get a disc injury and the bones start to collapse, they actually rotate on each other. And when that happens, it changes the shape of the disc relative to your entry point and your destination point. So you have to take into consideration that rotation with the x-ray machine to try to line up the best path for the disc. I think that looks pretty darn good. That's probably the best we're gonna get. So let's just leave it there. So, and then of course, rotation uh, is going to kick one side of the bones out, but also you get kyphosis, you get hyperlordosis, you get listhesis, which is a slippage this way, you get lateral listhesis, a slippage this way. So, you're dealing with slippages, twisting, collapsing, kinking of the spine. So, everybody's spine is slightly different, but it's different in predictable ways. And what I have to do here at the beginning is I have to account for those geometrical anomalies that do occur with different people.
okay, on top of everything else I'm doing. And that's why I have to line the fluoro up so perfectly as much as I can because, yeah, that's just numbing medicine going in. It's trying to make you feel better. If you don't line it up properly, you're going to end up putting this somewhere it doesn't belong. And then you get a complication, and that's not, that's not a good thing. So we've done this surgery now for, just relax, Sean. We've done this surgery now for 15 years. I've never had a complication. It's the only spine surgery in the world that's not had a complication. And that's because I'm the only one that does it, and I've not had a complication with it. So that's, that's why it's not had a complication. So it's a very safe surgery, but once other people start doing it more, there'll probably be complications. It's because not everybody's trained the same way, not everybody has the same standards of operating. You get a lot of variation with surgeons. All right, so there it is. That should be pretty close to the disc herniation at L45. I can kind of feel it, Sean. Let's get an AP. So far, we've lost about five drops of blood. Okay, you stub, you stub your toe running around outside without shoes, you're going to lose more blood than we do during the surgery. Five drops of blood is nothing. All right, let's keep going. Back to a lateral. You can see the curvature, right? Don't move, you're doing great, we're almost done. We're gonna put you to sleep soon. So we have a perfect trajectory. We're gonna put you to sleep soon, don't worry. Where do you feel that? Yeah, all right. Now, how long have you had back pain for? Sean? Over two years? Did you have back pain longer than two years? Sean, I must be bumping against the end plate. That's fine. All right, so did you ever have back pain before two years? Off and on. Off and on. So when did your back pain start, like the first time you ever got it? How many years ago? Just pick a number, 10, 20, 30. 15. All right, and when you started getting back pain, um, it kind of came and went, right? And then it became pretty much constant two years ago. All right, so folks, what happened was she, she basically injured her disc, probably, let's just say, 15 years ago, and she started with what's called an annular tear. And everybody's back pain or neck pain or thoracic pain, their pain from a disc always starts the same. It's a tear within the annulus fibrosis. So if you're looking at a disc, can you see this, Diego? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. Hi. Can, can you hear me? Can you see this? Yes. Diego? C can you hear me? Hello? Diego Maradona? Can you hear me right can now? Can you see this? Yes, I can hear it. Yes. Can you see the drawing? Yes, I can. All right, so this is the disc. It has a tough outer wall, and it's got a jelly center. That's what these little dots are, jelly. It's called the nucleus propulsus. That's what the jelly is, NP. Now, people all get the same exact thing happening. They get trauma to the disc, bending, twisting, jumping, whatever. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch Fail Army, okay, on YouTube, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So they did something. They got a tear in the wall of the disc that holds the jelly in, and now the jelly starts to seep out. So step one is the annular tear or tear in the wall of the annulus. Step two is the jelly herniates. So step one is an annular tear. Step two is a herniation. You don't start getting back pain until you get the herniation. And the reason is once the herniation of the nucleus propulsus wedges into the annular tear, it causes inflammation. And the inflammation is where people get their pain. That was discovered by me here at the Duke Spine Institute back in basically 2006. And I published these results in PubMed in 2012 and 13. So we're going to test two discs, L4-5 and L5-S1, to confirm whether or not they're, they're actually the source of her pain. Have you watched any of these surgeries? 
Do you remember this part? All right, just lay still, okay? How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? The highest they went was a nine? So L5S1 was a nine over 10. Is that where you typically get your back pain? But that's the area, right? Yeah. All right, so it was a nine over 10 concordant. So I just tested the, uh, did you get a picture? Good. I tested the uh, L5S1 disc and notice how not much of the dye leaked out backwards. That's probably why it didn't go even higher, but she kind of arched. It all has to do with needle position in the disc and how big the tear is. You okay? All right. How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? 10? All right, now look at that one. In the back, you can see the actual tear in the annulus. Can you point that out, please, Jordan? Little white arrow showing the tear. Yeah, just put it still. Actually, circle the tear for me. Yeah, right there. And then point to it. You can see the black line right there. That's the annular tear at L45. It's huge. And that whole tear there, right there where the arrow is, that's where the inflammation is, and that's where her back pain's coming from. And that was discovered at Duke's Spine. So there's millions and millions of people out there suffering with back pain and neck pain. You get to go to sleep now. When you wake up, we'll be down. That was a 10 over 10, and that was also concordant. Now, folks, that's a spondylolisthesis grade one at L45. We're not going to fuse her. We're not going to laminectomize her. We're not going to microdiscectomize her. We're simply going to repair the annular tear with the Duke laser disc repair, the only surgery in the world that repairs the annular tear. And what's going to happen is her pain's going to go away without fusion, without artificial discs, without microdiscectomy, without laminectomy, without open surgery and without pain and without bleeding, basically. Yes, what was she saying? Shout out to her mom who's watching yeah, in Oklahoma. And her son in Louisiana. Okay, so you heard that she had a shout out to her family members who are watching and she said, it's time for me to go to sleep. Thank you very much for all your support and well wishing. Folks, if you're watching this, family members, it's important to understand this patient was not faking their pain all these years. It was real. And the sad thing is she's probably seen countless doctors, nurses, gone online asking people for help and probably got a same response which is there's nothing wrong with you it's all in your head I hear this all the time from people out there suffering with chronic pain in their back or neck and the doctors can't figure out where the pain's coming from so they blame the patient and say there's something wrong with the patient rather than there's something wrong with themselves the problem folks is not the patients it's the doctors it's the therapists it's the people who have not made the right diagnosis as to the cause of the pain and have not provided the right treatment to eliminate the pain. And that's, we're gonna provide that treatment today. So if it's the first time you've ever watched this kind of surgery, this is a revolutionary surgery it done endoscopically on the spine. And if you ask your spine doctors or spine people where you live, hey, why don't you do this? They're gonna think that you've just landed from Mars because they're not gonna even know what you're talking about, all right? This is not being taught in residency programs. It's not being taught at training institutes for spine surgeons because the big implant companies, the companies that sell screws and rods and artificial discs, they don't want you to see the surgery. They don't want the doctors to be trained on the surgery. Why? Because there's no money to be made with this surgery. We're not putting in screws and rods. We're gonna avoid all of that. Have I done screws and rods? Absolutely. I'm probably one of the most screwy, ruddy, KG platy surgeons in the United States. I've done thousands of fusions with screws and rods. And then I started doing these endoscopic surgeries, much less invasive. And I watched my patients do better than the fusion, better than laminectomy, better than microdiscectomy, without complications, without post-operative pain, without blood loss, without hospitalization. All of these are done outpatient. And I was amazed. And I went from being a maximally invasive surgeon 
which I still do from time to time as needed, to becoming the most minimally invasive spine surgeon, not just for the back, but for thoracic herniations and cervical. And this procedure works amazing for all of them. It literally takes the pain away and cures the back pain. Why? Because we're targeting the one little place where the pain is coming from that other doctors have failed to recognize as the source of pain, which is the annular tear. And I've published on this, and we've been treating these patients now for years, and we have exactly the same result with every patient, 100% elimination of their pain. Now, 1% of our patients do get a re-herniation. They get another herniation that comes from doing something they're not supposed to usually. Uh, that's lifting something heavy after surgery or bending at the waist. Um, and I can tell you right now, even though the pain will be gone right after the surgery, the pain she's had for 15 years on and off and then constant for the last two, it'll be gone, okay? But what people get confused about is that the disc is not healed. The pain's gone because I've cleaned away the inflammation. But what's not, what's not done yet is the healing. And the healing literally takes, um, where is the tube? That's an interesting one. I can't tell if it's in the disc or not because it almost looks like a shadow by the facet, but I don't think that is. I'm not sure though. Let me have the uh, tube distractor. I know, I think it is too, but I gotta make sure. I don't take any guesses, John. It looks like it's in the disc, shot. Shot. Luis, you agree? Uh, Do you agree the yeah, tube, the tip of the tube is in the disc? That's what I'm seeing. Yes, I just want to make absolutely sure. Shot. Yep. Yeah. All right, we're in. Good. So that's where you want to be with the uh, tube. You want to be inside the disc. And you don't want to be in too far. You want to be in, yeah, usually no more than halfway in. Usually a third to a half is good. Depends on several things. But um, the angle of the fluoro will tell you one thing versus another. A parallax, complicated imaging. Um, variations so you have to take all that into account I know I make the surgery look easy but that's because number one I'm a very good surgeon but number two I've done you know I've done over a thousand discs now okay maybe uh, I've done over 1,300 surgeries with an average of 2.4 discs per surgery so that's you know 3,000 discs and when you do 3,000 discs with no complications and 100% pain relief every time, it means you're doing something right, okay? And so I just kind of do the same thing, but it's not exactly the same thing, okay? So you can't say, oh, hey, look, you put your incision right here on this patient, so that's exactly where it'll be on the next one. Actually, that's not true. The incision on the next patient may be further to the lateral, to the side. It may be more inferior, it may be more superior. It all depends on their pelvic anatomy, like the anatomy of the, um, the pelvic bones and the facet joint and the disc. And where is the spine located relative to the back? So all those things have to be weighed in. And I do that without really talking about it to you because it gets too complicated and too babbly. And I don't want to babble you off of not watching because there's so much to good stuff to see. There's a little bit of blood clot. A um, little bit of herniation there. Don't worry about it. There'll be more. So there, we're inside the disc. This is all inflamed, damaged disc. Look how swollen it is. I can just tell by looking at it, it's edematous. Edematous means it has edema. Edema means swollen. Why do people get edema? Anybody know? Inflammation is the most common cause. The other is a backup of the, uh, of the um, lymphatic system, right? You've seen people with swollen legs. So that, that's edema too, <clears throat> but for a different reason. Not inflammation, but it's called hydrostatic pressure or oncotic pressure issues. 
But that's not what we're dealing with in the disc. We're dealing with inflammation. And inflammation causes edema. And this is all scar tissue. This is scar tissue right here, the white stuff. This is not normal disc. This is scar tissue from inflammation. And this inflammation, folks, has been going on for a long time. This scar tissue, thick like this, you don't get that. How big is the laser? Well, the laser side to side is half a millimeter, the glass tube. Okay, the blue thing is probably a full millimeter, but the actual glass part at the end is half a millimeter. That's a bone spur right there. So people who don't think lasers can zap away bone spurs, wrong. There's a lot of misinformation out there about laser spine surgery. Nobody really does laser spine surgery, folks, but us here at Duke Spine. Even the Laser Spine Institute that used to say they did laser spine surgery, I had friends who worked there as surgeons. They never used the laser. They just use it as a marketing gimmick. But with this procedure you're watching now, you have to use the laser. And the laser is the only way to get rid of the scar tissue. No... Um, grabber, no shear, no, no, no other surgical tool that surgeons usually use will work. Trust me, I've tried it, it doesn't work. The only thing the grabbers do is they take away chunks of disc herniation once you freed them up from the scar tissue in the annulus. So, what are we doing here, folks? We're doing surgery to cure back pain. We're doing surgery to cure her leg pain. So, everyone knows surgery can be done to cure leg pain or sciatica. What people don't know is that surgery can be done to cure back pain. And I don't mean getting lucky once in a while and curing back pain. I'm talking about 100% of the time, curing back pain. That's because the right diagnosis was made and the right treatment is being done to, re to address the actual source of the back pain, which is the annular tear right here. That's what I'm debriding. Go ahead, Diego. Can you hear me? All too well, okay. very loud. Okay, I'll lower it. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, a question from YouTube says, you mentioned that the disc is collapsed, but it didn't look that way in the MRI. Do you feel like it got worse since the MRI scan? Yeah, it's a great question. So the disc is collapsed. Um, it's not normal. If you're looking at L5S1, Look at L5S1 and then go up two discs, actually three discs, and look at L23. L23 is a normal looking disc. That's not collapsed. L5S1 is definitely collapsed compared to L23. And considering L5S1 is the biggest disc along with L45, it should be even taller than the L23 disc. So there's definitely collapse going on. Now, what your definition of collapse is and my definition may be two different definitions. Of course, mine is the correct definition. What collapse means is if it sinks down and loses some of its height, that's called collapsing. I didn't say it's completely collapsed. Co completely collapsed means it's bone on bone. There's no disc left. You see this right here? There's disc. That's disc there. It's between the bones. So the disc is not completely collapsed. I never would have said that. It's collapsed. Collapse means it's starting to collapse. It's maybe, it's probably lost. If I had to guess, I'd say probably 33% of its height. And so it has 66% of the height remaining. So it's 33% collapsed at L5S1, the disc we're fixing right now. It's a good question. Now let's talk about disc collapse. Does it even matter if the disc is collapsed 99% or 100%? No, it doesn't. You can have back pain from a disc that's 99 or 100% collapsed, okay? Where does the pain come from? It comes from the annular tear that's still there. The annular tear doesn't go away because the disc collapsed. What goes away when a disc collapses is the nucleus propulsus or the jelly in the middle. So the more collapsed the disc is, the more the jelly has been damaged, destroyed, eliminated, okay? And guess how the jelly gets destroyed? It gets destroyed by inflammation the same inflammation that comes from the annular tear. As a matter of fact, it's the inflammation in the annular tear that destroys the nucleus propulsus of the disc. Do you understand what I'm saying? So think about a volcano. There's a volcano, all right, and it's inactive. 
and it's sitting in the middle of a vast plain of farmland. And for the last uh, centuries, the farmers of this farmland have been growing crops, growing all kinds of vegetables and fruits, and it's a fertile plain, okay? And some of you know why it's fertile. We'll get to that later. And then suddenly one day the volcano becomes active and spews all this ash out into the sky. What do you think is going to happen to the fertile farmland around the volcano? It's going to die. The reason it dies is the ash blocks the sun, it covers all the plants, and it acidifies the soil massively so that everything dies. So when this tear happens, the annular tear and the herniation occurs into the tear, it's like a volcano erupting. And all the inflammation that results as a result of the tear and the herniation spreads to the surrounding disc that isn't even in the tear and it causes changes to the disc, damage to the disc, collapsing of the disc, a process we call spondylosis or degeneration. So the degeneration of a disc is a result of the herniation and the annular tear and the inflammation that goes on within it. Now, where else will you hear this? Nowhere else in the world. Why? Because I'm the one who discovered it. So you're hearing it from me. But this knowledge has not been passed on to other doctors or other people or nurses or therapists yet. They're literally living in the dark ages of understanding back pain and herniated discs. So why do we do the broadcast? So you guys can learn the truth. The truth is, is that it's the annular tear and herniation combined causes an inflammatory reaction that causes the destruction of the entire disc over time. Collapsing of the disc, degeneration of the disc, bone spurs, osteophytes. And so the sooner you get your disc repaired with a Duke laser disc repair, the sooner you stop that inflammatory cascade and that process of the disc basically dying. Nobody in the world ever understood why the disc collapsed. Nobody has an understanding of why degenerative disc disease occurs. But now we've discovered it at Duke Spine Institute, and we're telling you why it occurs. It is an inf inflammation and an inflammatory cascade. And there's now research that supports that. There are scientists, usually in China, who have done research to show that the, the uh, source of disc degeneration is inflammatory mediators. Well, guess where it comes from? It comes from the annular tear, the one that we're repairing right now. Okay? All right. So we're just at the back corner of this herniation at L5S1. She's not happy with this, but that's because this is the painful zone. And by the way, most of this was scar tissue. Just like the patient I um, treated on Tuesday, his discs were vastly scarred. By the way, we saw him yesterday in clinic. He has 100% of his back pain is gone, 100% relief. Just one day after his laser surgery, we're going to be publishing his testimonial later uh, today. Right, Diego? Yes. Yeah. And so he's from uh, Orlando. It was funny because when I told him to count to put him to sleep on Tuesday, he, he started counting in English, and I said, you got to count in a different language besides English. And what did he count in? Anybody remember? Korean. He counted in Korean. <laughs> like, and I know Korean because I'm married to one. And I said, how do you know Korean? And he said, my wife is Korean. I said, oh, that's a good reason. So he was counting in Korean. And uh, anyway, he came back. And he's doing fantastic. Yesterday we saw him. No pain in his back, no pain in his legs. He had the Duke laser disc repair. It was very successful for him. And uh, we'll see him back in another week to check on him again. All right, we're just about done at L5S1. And I can tell you right now, there's no surgical instrument that would fit down this tube that would do this job that the laser has done. Let me have a grabber. I'm going to try to get as much of this out as I can to give this patient the very best result possible. Now, 
L5S1, let's talk about it for a minute. There, there are endoscopic spine surgeons worldwide. And these spine surgeons do endoscop endoscopic surgery differently. Some of them do two portals or two tubes. Some of them do one. The more skilled surgeons use one. They don't need two. And I can tell you this, the most common endoscopic spine surgeries being done worldwide are in the lower back, just where we are today. And they are for leg pain or pinched nerves causing weakness or leg symptoms, okay? Nobody does endoscopic surgery for back pain. They do it all for leg, leg symptoms. Except we do it for back pain because we know how to fix the back pain. And what I do is different than those other surgeons. It's more advanced. Fixing leg pain is easy. Fixing back pain is much harder. So long story short, L5S1, the disc we're fixing right now, is almost impossible to get to. You saw it took me a little bit longer to get to than the L45. And the reason for that is it's, it's the angle and the facet and the iliac crest, okay? It's a lot of things. And the disc is somewhat collapsed, so it makes it harder. And there's scoliosis, okay? So my point is this. Um, endoscopic spine surgeons that do transforaminal disc surgery, like through the foramen like I'm doing, they don't do L5S1. They leave it alone. And 50% of the disc problems are at L5S1. So s some of them will actually do what's called an interlaminar or translaminar approach, where they actually go through the lamina. And um, it basically becomes a microdiscectomy because they're removing bone from the lamina, they're removing ligaments, and that is gonna destabilize the spine. So I don't recommend the translaminar endoscopic approach to the L5S1. I recommend the transforaminal, but there's not very many surgeons that are able to do it. Literally worldwide, there's probably just five at most in the world that can do transforaminal L5S1, like we're doing right now. There's a little bit of fat there. I'm just trying to get as medial. There's a little herniation medially, and I'm trying to get as much of that as I can, which I'm doing. And I can tell this is definitely a part of her pain problem because she's responding. Now, <clears throat> if tissue isn't painful, they're not, patients don't respond with a pain response, like wiggling their body or trying to get away from the pain, okay? so. Painful tissues, not all the tissue in your body is painful. There's a little bone spur right there in the end plate of S1. Not all tissue in your body is painful. It's very important to understand that. Some tissues have no nerve fibers or pain receptors in them, okay? Um, tendons and ligaments do. The center of this disc, the blue stuff in the middle, doesn't. And that's why most doctors don't understand how a disc can be a cause of pain. It's because they don't understand it's the outer part of the disc that actually causes the pain, the annulus fibrosus. And the outer annulus does have pain fibers. So contrary to popular belief, the spinal disc is innervated with pain fibers. And those pain fibers are what are called somatic afferent pain fibers, meaning that they go to parts of your brain where pain is highly localized. It's not just pain fibers, but they're the really bad ones, the ones that, that are, cause a sharp pain. So this is why most neurosurgeons and physiatrists and orthopedic surgeons that do spine surgery and insurance companies and everybody doesn't understand. This is where they're getting tripped up. They all think that the spinal disc doesn't have pain fibers, but it does for two reasons. Number one, it normally has pain fibers in the outer half of the annulus fibrosus. And number two, once inflammation starts after the annular tear and the nuclear material comes out, you get an ingrowth of granulation tissue from chronic inflammation and you get the in ingrowth of pain fibers into that granulation tissue, which can go all the way to the core of the disc because there's nothing that stops granulation tissue from growing except inflammation. 
And as the inflammation progresses from the outer part of the annulus to the inside of the disc, you're gonna see granulation tissue and inflammatory tissue that reaches all the way to the inside of the disc. Something that shouldn't even be possible because there's no blood supply down there. But of course the blood supply grows down there. People are forgetting that blood supplies can grow in the human body. And they're all uh, assa assessing the situation saying, oh, well normally there's no blood supply. Yeah, but this is not a normal situation. This is abnormal. And under abnormal circumstances, you get abnormal things happening. Is it normal for your liver to grow to be three times the size of a normal liver? No, but when you damage it, it does. It gets inflamed and it hypertrophies. Is it normal for your muscles to be gigantic? No, but if you lift weights all the time, your muscles respond. So your body responds to the chronic inflammation from the annular tear and the interposed herniation, and it creates an inflammatory response that actually grows all the way down to the center of the disc. And that's why we have to go down here to remove this inflammatory tissue to get rid of the pain. Yes. Let the truth be known. Unfortunately, this misunderstandings of human physiology by most doctors is the source of people having chronic back pain, you know? Sometimes it really pisses me off. Like, why do I have to be the one to discover this kind of stuff? I just want to have a nice, simple life. Why can't somebody else figure it out? And I can just learn from them, right? But unfortunately, nobody else has figured it out in hundreds of years. So we had to figure it out. I think that's pretty good. Let me see this grabber. Now, when we do this surgery or any surgery on the spine, you can't expect the disc to look normal, okay? The disc is never gonna look normal. Again, once you've damaged it, discs don't ever go back to looking normal. So if the expectation is to see a normal looking disc, this is not plastic surgery of the disc. This is not a boob job of the disc where at the end of the boob job you expect perfect breasts, all right? This is not a cosmetic procedure. We are not doing cosmetic surgery here. We're doing physiological surgery. We're removing the protagonist, or sorry, the antagonist, which is the, the inflammatory tissue within the annular tear. That's what the surgery does. So when you go to look afterwards, you're not gonna see perfect discs. And you know, people that expect to are misunderstanding what we're doing here. And so that's why we do broadcasts is to, to teach people the truth, all right? So after I'm done, the pain will be gone, but the disc will never look normal. This is a whole new field of spine surgery, folks. If, if you, those of you who are watching, if you haven't figured this out, what we do here at Duke Spine Institute is different than anybody else in the world. And the reason is because we understand the disease condition and we understand where the problem is. And that's why we're able to cure pain, why nobody else can. And we cure it all the time, consistently, every case. All right, that's it, we're done. Anything beyond this is gilding the lily, which I don't do. We're gonna suck out the juices, which is just the irrigation. We've lost probably I don't know, 10 drops, maybe 20 drops of blood, something like that. Now this is betadine. Betadine is an antiseptic developed by NASA. We've never had an infection from our surgery, um, but we don't want one. Ah, let's see, Luis. Success! <laughs> no, it's, I think it's good. Is there anything bigger than a 22? A what? So that's L5S1, one down, one to go. Now, um, we already have the, uh, the, other, um, the other needle in place. Come on in. Okay, can you guys see this, Diego? Yes. I'm gonna pull this tube out. Uh-huh. Okay, just apply a little pressure to the muscles. 
so we don't get any bleeding. Come on in. So what have we done? We've made a cut in the skin that's a quarter inch. We've separated the muscles with a little dilator, which doesn't damage the muscles at all. And after we pass the muscles, we enter the foramen. And the foramen has just some fat in it, so you're not really doing any damage in there. And then we pass right through the annular tear and disc herniation together. So literally, there's no damage done anywhere to this patient's back at all. Now, Diego, I sent you a picture yesterday. Yes, I you did. I want you to bring it up. Okay. Do you remember the picture of the MRI with the muscles? And I put the arrows on the muscles. It's like an MRI axial, and it's got two red arrows and two green arrows. Yeah, okay. I found it. All right, I'll Can bring you bring it up. that up for our audience? Let me know when you have it up. Okay. Folks, what I'm going to show you is not my patient, but some picture I found on the Internet. Um, sorry. It's a picture I found of a patient who had a laminectomy, and the picture is showing you the damage to the muscle that open spine surgery does. It was a microdiscectomy slash laminectomy. And the muscles in the spine are 50% are dead and scar tissue now as a result of the open surgery. Okay? This is what happens to every single patient that has open surgery. Their muscles are going to die. With endoscopic surgery, there's no muscle death. The muscles are perfectly normal after surgery. The reason why open surgery kills the muscles is because it has to peel it off the spine and then retract them, the muscles for a while. You know what I mean, Sean? So when you're retracting the muscles with your retractors like we did on Tuesday, that takes away the blood supply to the muscle. So what do you think is going to happen to the muscle if you take the blood supply? If you take the blood supply away from muscle for three hours or less, nothing happens. They just get angry. If you take away the blood supply to a skeletal muscle for three and a half hours or more, it dies. And when it dies, it makes scar tissue. And that's exactly what this picture shows. And I see this all the time in people who have had um, laminectomies and microdiscectomies. Mm -hmm. The surgeons are killing your back, destroying it. People don't want to hear this. You know, I go online and I try to teach people about the dangers of microdiscectomies, laminectomies, and how they cause so much damage to your bones, ligaments, and your spine by taking away the bone and the ligaments and the muscles. And people don't want to hear it. But you know what? I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm here to tell you the truth, okay? And frankly, I don't care if you don't want to hear it, then don't listen. But for the people that want to know the truth, that's what we're trying to teach you is the truth. Okay. Why do you think there are no movies of war? Why do you think there are no movies of people getting shot and killed in war? Because we don't want you to see what war really is about. It's about death. It's about murder. It's about inhumane acts. And all that is hidden from the public. Because if the public were to see it, there would be such an outcry. Sean? Hold on. Uh, let's, let me just make sure. Let me have the guide wire. Yes, sir. So the reality is, is that, Sean, we don't want people to see death and destruction. We don't want people to see the damage that happens as a result of spine surgery. You know, that's what surgeons don't want. They don't want, to, they don't want people to see that. Sean? Mm -hmm. Sean? Let's just let me have that. Uh, yeah. Sean? I can't see the guide wire. Sean? Do you see it? I don't see it there. There, maybe that's it right there. Sean, yes, you see it now, right? Yeah. Sean, all right. Why are we having trouble? Are you are you pulsing? Yes, Take it off pulse for a minute. Let's see what's going on. 
All right, that's better. Let's go with an AP view and just be careful with the guide wire. So the point I'm trying to make is I'm not here to show you what you want to see. I'm here to show the world the truth. And with open back surgery, laminectomies, microdiscectomies, there's so much damage done to the spine. It's, it's tr truly a bad, bad thing. All right. Yeah. I need to aim a little bit more uh, medial. It's interesting. All right, let's go back to a lateral view, please. Shot. All right, just give me a second while I, I want to make sure we get everything done right here. Shot. 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 AP. That felt pretty good. Let's just verify. So this is a listhesis level means the bones are out of alignment. So I have to make sure that we're in the right place by checking my pictures. It felt like we went through the tear. It looks pretty good to me. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, yep, go back to a lateral. So we take different kinds of pictures with the fluoro throughout the surgery, but almost all the pictures are either front back or side, side to side. And um, I use that information to recreate where we are in the spine. If you just use one view, like the lateral view, you don't know, are you really inside that disc or not? <clears throat> Shot. Maybe you're not inside the disc. Maybe you're on the side of the disc. And that would be a problem because you won't be able to fix the disc if you're not inside. Shot. All right. All right, I'm not sure where the tube tip is again, but let's pull back on the dilator and see. I'm going to show you what um, we use here so you can get a better understanding of the, what the dilator is. I think the tube's in. Sean? Yeah, we're in. All right, so can you see this? you want the lights on, Diego? Or yeah, can you see this? it's fine. It's fine. We can see. You guys can see it good? Yes, we can see. All right, so remember, this, this is called the dilator, okay? I didn't create it. I didn't invent it. It's been used for, gosh, uh, probably 50 years for endoscopic surgery, but not on the spine, but endoscopic surgery elsewhere. What a dilator does, okay, it literally opens tissues up. By pushing it through, it spreads the tissues around it. It's almost like this aerodynamic, but I guess you can call it tissue dynamic instrument. Like aerodynamic things split the air going over them and cause airflow to go above or below or to the sides. This thing does is a tissue dynamic instrument. It literally splits the muscles and doesn't cut them. It literally just separates the fibers and you go through and then you, when you come out, you're done. And the muscle's not torn, it's actually just spread and it comes back to its normal shape. So unlike open back surgery, microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, artificial disc, where they're actually cutting the muscle, okay, and peeling it off your spine, there's massive damage going on there. Did you show our audience that picture? Yes, I have it up right now. All right, so take a look at the green arrows. The green arrows are the normal muscle. That's what normal muscle fibers look like on an MRI. And then look at the red arrows. Those are the muscles closer to the midline, and that's what was killed by that patient's laminectomy. I didn't do the laminectomy. I, I don't do laminectomies, okay? I don't do microdiscectomies because they c kill the muscles. And people need your muscles. That's where pain comes from after surgery is the muscles. So if the muscles are damaged severely, the pain is gonna come from the muscles. And that's why so many people have pain after surgery because the surgeons just kill the muscles. Why do they do it? They don't do it on purpose, folks. This is how they're taught to do it. And there's, they don't know any other way, but the surgery you're watching now is the other way. You know, they just have never been trained to do it. 
So if all you know how to do is one thing, micro, uh, microdiscectomies, laminectomies, you'll never improve for your patients and do better surgeries. At Duke Spine, we do the most advanced technology and techniques. So we don't kill muscle. Is it pretty obvious on that picture? It is. Yeah. I've got a lot of those, unfortunately. I take them in the clinic when I see people who've had surgery elsewhere. And there's even worse than that. You can see so much damage to the muscle. So traditional surgeries like microdiscectomies, laminectomy fusion, you get the big skin incision. So you have far more damage to the skin, which is bad. Most people say, I don't care how big the scar is, but the bigger your skin incision, the more chance of infection. The bigger the skin incision, the more chance of wound complications like dehiscence, where the wound falls apart. The bigger the incision, the more pain, the more narcotics you have to take. So the size of the skin incision actually matters. Smaller is always better. Um, and the laser surgery you're watching right now, Duke Laser Disc Repair, we have the smallest incision of all spine surgeries. There's nothing smaller, okay? Then you've got under the skin, you've got soft tissue damage to the muscle. With the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no muscle damage at all. And if you get an MRI of this patient's back after surgery and look at the muscles, there will be no damage. You won't see anything. On the other hand, any kind of microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, you see lots of muscle damage. So those are the things surgeons don't talk about. You know why? Because they, they don't realize there's an alternative that doesn't damage the muscles. They've been taught one way, and that one way is the way they do it, and they think nothing of it. As a matter of fact, they think nothing, nothing of it if you have a complication from spine surgery and you die. Oh well, that was a chance, you know, that was the risk. The patient knew it. And it happens. I'm not making this stuff up. I was just telling everyone on uh, Facebook the other day that my uncle just died in Los Angeles having back surgery. He didn't want to come here. He thought it was a simple procedure. He was going to, a, to I think it was USC or UCLA, and it was a laminectomy. He had a laminectomy in his back, okay? He didn't want to travel here for me to do it. He thought it was just too much trouble to fly all the way to Florida. He was older. He said, I'll just go to UCLA or USC. I can't remember one of the two. And he, uh, he had his laminectomy. Then he got an infection. And then he's, he got a heart attack. They had to put stents. And then he died, like literally within five days of his surgery. They just did his funeral, OK? Um, why do I talk about this? Because these surgeries are killing people, you know? And I realize it more now than ever before because I'm getting online and I'm seeing people talk about their outcomes from laminectomies or microdiscectomies or fusions. I'm seeing them, people, people die from it. I've never had a patient die from my spine surgery, not once. 26 years of operating. And that's because I'm very careful. I do my surgeries properly and I manage my patients properly. I will tell you this, I got out of the hospital because um, the hospital anesthesiologist and, and they had switched to nurse anesthetists, the patients were starting to get pneumonia and blood clots and heart failure. And I was trying to figure out why and I realized that they were giving them too much fluids during surgery. They were fluid overloading them. So the quality of anesthesia care is very important during surgery. It's not just the surgeon that can kill somebody, it's the anesthesiologist that can kill somebody. It's the nurses in recovery that can kill somebody by chewing too much fluid, you know? And so it's really a team approach and to have the very best outcomes from spine surgery, you have to have the best surgeon, the best anesthesiology, the best protocols, the best drugs, the best tools, the best implants, if that's what you're doing. You gotta have really, really high quality of everything and it has to be used properly, okay? I'm telling you, I can't believe how many people die and have serious complications from spine surgery. I have never had that happen in any of my patients. 
but that's because I pay attention to everything that happens with them. Now, who hires our anesthesiologist? I do. I make sure that the anesthesiologist is very good at what they do. They don't, they don't put the patient in harm's way. Okay, they're competent and they do good technique and they're prepared for something that could come up. Okay, they're able to code the patient. They're able to resuscitate the patient. They're able to manage their airway properly if they obstruct their airway. So I make sure that our, we have a good team and that the team is well trained and prepared. And that's, that's, you always have to be prepared because you never know. One of these days, someone's going to have something happen and you've got to be prepared. If you're prepared, then you can save the patient's life and keep them from having a serious issue. If you're not prepared, then one problem becomes another and then another. And you're dealing with a human life and people die. Okay? And no one likes to talk about death or complications related to surgery, but I do. Because there sh it shouldn't be happening. Not at the, especially not at the level that it's happening around the country, around the world. And it's really because of the type of surgery being done and it's being done, it's, it's a problem because of where it's being done, how it's being done, the equipment, the people, the uh, medications that are being used, the, the, the perioperative strategy of dealing with the patients and their pain. There's so many things wrong with way, the way we do spine surgery today in 2021 and we've been doing it wrong for, for a long time uh, as a country. There are 6,000 spine surgeons in the United States. There's the tear, by the way. And I'm only one of them, you know? I'm one spine surgeon out of 6,000. I can fix what I do wrong, but I can't fix what other people do wrong. They don't listen. They're too stubborn and arrogant. They don't care. And really, most spine surgeons have the attitude of, I already know everything, and if somebody's gonna die, they die. Oh, well, you know? I don't see it that way. I don't think anyone should die from an elective procedure. I don't think anyone should be, you know, made to suffer as a result of a complication from an elective procedure. Have I ever had a complication? Sure, I've had sometimes, a long time ago, I maybe had a dural tear where I had a spinal fluid leak, but it's rare. It's very rare. And um, that's a complication. And I don't have it with uh, the laser surgery. I've had it with open surgery. So how dare you? There's no reason, reason why surgery can't be fun, you know, as long as everything's going well for the patient and you're taking great care of the patient and you are um, progressing towards your goal at a good pace. There's no reason why surgery can't be fun and enjoyable. All right, so you can see that right there, that smooth surface is the end plate. That's the vertebral end plate. It's the bone on top of the disc, and that is L4, because we're in the L4-5 disc right now. The L5 superior end plate is gonna be right over there in that other side. We're not interested in the end plates. I'm not here to fix end plate problems. We don't touch the end plates. Sometimes we bang them up a little, but they don't care. Um, but what I'm here to do is repair this tear. Look how bad it is. All this blue stuff coming out is herniated disc stuck inside the tear. And I have a name for it. It's called interposed herniation. Interposed herniation. And interposed herniation, which is the nucleus material stuck in the annular tear, is the cause of the inflammation. It is the source of inflammation. It is the bad, the bad entity that we're here to remove. Woo, more herniation. Look at that. There's some granulation tissue. Did you see that pink stuff? Man, this is a big herniation here. Let's try to grab it out. It just keeps coming. We call a herniation that herniates into the tube while we're removing it a reverse herniation. There you go, a little bit. Because it's gone from, you know, herniating out of the disc to coming back into the disc area or the tube for us to remove. All right, I gotta reposition my um, tube to look down the, the annular tear. We're almost done. I think we got five minutes left maybe. Oh, that's a nice herniation piece. Doctor. 
I don't know if you heard me, but five minutes. Mm. So what do you think about stitches, Luis? You like them? Less oozing? I don't know what we should do. Just put a stitch. All right. Any questions from our audience? No questions, but a lot of praise. People saying that their jaws drop when they tell their friends what you do, and that you always do a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the compliments. But instead of compliments, send us chocolate brownies. I don't think I got to eat one of those chocolate brownies at the potluck yesterday. I was eyeing them. But they disappeared pretty quick. I tell you, there's nothing in the world like a chocolate brownie. A really good chocolate brownie, especially one with walnuts. It's a good thing my wife doesn't bake them for me because I would be probably another 100 pounds heavier than I am. Wow, herniations galore here. That's amazing. This disc was just really badly damaged. This is the one that, remember we did the dis discogram? There was a giant tear. Yeah, this is the 10 out of 10. Giant tear. And this is that tear. So the nerves that we're protecting are just outside the tube, and that's where we want them. We want them outside the tube. We don't want them in here where the laser is. The laser could do a lot of damage to those nerves if it, t if it zapped them. And the nerves I'm talking about are the nerve roots. The nerve roots. So basically, um, the nerve roots uh, are big. They're big white cables. They're about the same diameter as this grabber that's going in. You know, the metal grabber. If you look at the metal grabber, you'll get a pretty good idea of what the diameter of the nerve root is. And they're just outside the walls both walls, uh, two walls of this retractor. All right, I've grabbed out as much as I can. I'm going to use the laser again. And this is taking a while because there's so much uh, scar tissue here. Scar tissue takes a long time to zap away with the laser. Unlike normal nucleus, um, normal nucleus that's not scarred from inflammation, uh, that normal nucleus is easy. It just, just melts away like butter in a hot knife. But the uh, the scarred up nuclear material is just so thick. We call it, I call it collagenized. That's a term that I got from uh, Dr. Anthony Young, my uh, one of my teachers who taught me endoscopic surgery. He no longer practices, but he was a pioneer in the United States with lumbar surgery, lower back surgery, transforaminal surgery. Um, and I have a lot of respect for Dr. Young. He's from China. Oh, look at that little herniation that wiggled out. That was pretty cool. Anyway, Dr. Young, I think he's like 80 years old now. So I was very lucky to be able to train with him in Phoenix, Arizona. I had to travel to Phoenix many times, leave my practice, leave my family sometimes, most of the time, and just go to his meetings and just learn. And it's a good thing I'm a quick learner. I learn very, very quickly, uh, especially with hands-on stuff. That's one of my skills, but I'm not good at learning math quickly. I'm just good at learning like things to do with your hands quickly, I guess, motor skills. Maybe my cerebellum is just really well developed. But uh, long story short, I picked up uh, his technique. You know, I probably went to his, his center in Phoenix maybe six times over the course of 
three or four years and learned and improved my skills and refined them. Uh, but Dr. Young was a master surgeon, endoscopic spine surgeon, probably the leader in the United States before me, and now he's retired. But he didn't do the Duke laser disc repair. He only did decompressions, getting the herniation out, getting the pressure off the nerve root. I do different kind of surgery. I do decompressions. Those are easy. But I do an annular debridement, and I'm the first to do it in the world, the first to publish it. And the purpose of the annular debridement is to get rid of the back pain or neck pain, if it's in the neck, obviously. So I modified the basics of the surgery to do uh, the debridement. And that's that debridement that takes the back pain away, not the discectomy itself. If you unpinch a nerve root like Dr. Young did for many years, you don't get rid of the back pain. So that's why he had a lot of patients who still had back pain. That wasn't his target. You know, like most spine surgeons, they don't believe back pain can be cured with surgery. So they don't even try. They don't know what causes it. And they send you to the pain management doctor. And of course, the pain management docs will never fix back pain because to fix back pain, you need to, you need to actually treat the source, which is the annular tear. And they don't do annular tear surgery. They just do shots and needle procedures. So that's why we broadcast to teach people the truth. Oh, look at that herniation. Oh yeah, baby. All right, it's getting too big to laser. We're just gonna grab it out. Pretty cool, huh? Watching a herniation come out. Oh, baby. Oh, that was a good one. Oh, let's look at this thing. It's monstrous. Put the light on. Yeah, we see it. Oh, nice. You guys see this thing? Yeah, we see it. It's huge. All right. That is a big herniation. You know, most surgeons like to high five after something like that. So I'm going to high five Luis. Go ahead. Just to get the, you know, obligatory high five in. I wonder if there's any more hiding in there. We shall soon see. So since nobody's asking questions, I'll just keep talking. Um, one of the nice things about this laser that we use called the Holmium YAG laser is that it doesn't just, why don't you let him touch the buttons? Oh, he is? We're, we're training uh, Flynn today. Flynn is learning to be a surgical technician. He's under the tutelage, <laughs> I love that word, tutelage of Luis, the master, the master of the operating room and the surgery center over here, the master of the universe. You guys remember He-Man? You know, He-Man, just that's Luis right there. Didn't he wear like a, a lederhosen kind of outfit? So Luis, for Halloween this year, I want to see some, I want to, yeah, I want to, I want to see some later hosen. And you're going to have to dye your hair blonde. Ah, another herniation. That's another big one. This is lateral. Most surgeons would not look lateral. They don't know. Dr. Young taught me always look lateral because that's where you'll miss something. And if you miss it, there'll still be a problem when you leave that you didn't address. I have a lot of love and respect for Dr. Young in case you couldn't tell, okay? Because he really was an incredible person and surgeon and physician. Cared deeply for his patients and his results. Uh, we, we have a new question, Dr. Duke. Yeah. Uh, a YouTube viewer is curious, what is the average hospital stay for a spinal fusion at L5-S1? Yeah, so great question. Um, YouTube viewer, thank you for asking. Um, questions like this are tough because 
inevitably I'm going to disappoint you with my answer. Um, I do L4-5 fusions, and we don't do them at the hospital. We do them outpatient, meaning that you go home two hours after surgery, okay? And I've been doing it that way for 10 years now. So there is no hospital stay. So you're obviously having a fusion done at kind of an older place where they do older technology, older treatment. And your, your guess is as good as mine with old stuff, you know? When it comes to old technology, I'm not really an expert on old technology. What I'm an expert on is new technology. Now, if I had to guess, I would say three days is probably what your surgeon will keep you. Hope as long as you don't get a complication. Once you get a complication, then obviously you got to stay longer. You know, a complication like blood clot or um, you know, pneumonia or something weird. Okay, I would just caution you, if you at all possible, try to get it, your surgery done somewhere a bit more advanced. I know it's not the answer you want to hear, and I feel badly telling you the truth, but I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to be truthful. So the truth is, is that your surgery should be done, and you should go home two hours after your surgery, if it's done the right way. Um, and anyone that keeps you in the hospital automatically tells me it's the wrong way. So when you start going down the wrong way path, there's a lot of wrong way things you could do, and then they could prolong your stay even longer. But assuming everything goes perfect for you, I would say two to three days. Two to three days. Uh, we have a YouTube viewer who wants to make you walnut brownies. Who wants to what? Make you walnut brownies. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. One of my YouTube viewers wants to make walnut brownies. I would love it. <clears throat> Thank you. They will be accepted, and they will be appreciated by all. We, I always share whatever, whatever uh, bounty comes in. We do it the pirate way, you know, since we're so close to the Caribbean. We have the pirate philosophy, right, Luis? Plus, I got Luis to deal with, you know? <laughs> he's, he's from Puerto Rico, and, you know, that's where all the pirates hung out. He has pirate blood. And so we share everything. So whenever somebody brings anything in, I always put it in the break room, and we open it up, and we let everybody partake. So your brownies will be greatly appreciated if you truly send them to us or bring them to us. All right, so clearly it's taking longer than five minutes because there's so much here still, and I don't have any control over that. Um, but I don't leave the party before the party's over. So I'm not just gonna, you know, I know there's a surgeon I know who would, but I can't mention his name. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you have a tea, a tea time, you got to get to, right? So that's why I don't play golf. So you don't have to worry about me missing my tea time. People ask me, why don't you play golf? It's because I operate. If I was a golf player, then I'd have a tea time and I have to finish my surgeries faster. I just have to leave some of the work not done. But because I don't play golf, I don't have a tea time to make. I don't hear any laughter. This is supposed to be funny, guys. Flynn, you better start laughing if you want to stay in this operating room, okay? You're laughing? I just can't hear you in the back of the room there? Good. You never want your boss to feel like his jokes are not funny, okay? It's one of the first things you'll learn about the operating room. When a surgeon cuts a joke, you got to laugh. Even if it hurts you to laugh, you still have to laugh, okay? There we go. All right, what is that there? Let's go grab her. So this is that, um, the disc that was listhesed. Remember one bone was slipping forward on the other? So I think we're seeing a little bit of that right here. Just about done. I'd say another two minutes, a real two minutes. Not a, I'm lying to you two minutes. 
So we're going to wrap this up in about two minutes. If you have questions for me, please write them down. And uh, I'm going to go over that um, that picture of the dead dead muscle. Okay, uh, Diego. In a few minutes, I'll head over to the okay our broadcast room, and I will jump in front of you guys, and you guys can ask me questions. So start typing your questions up right now. For those of you who don't know, Duke Spine Institute is located in Orlando, Florida. We have patients from all over the world that travel here and get their backs and necks fixed. So don't feel like traveling is a big deal because it's not. It's better that you travel here and get it done the right way than have a bad surgery or something done badly somewhere else. Okay, we'll do it right. And then, of course, we have the minimally invasive technology others don't have. Plus, we've got a secret weapon, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. Okay, so you can bring your family, go to Disney, enjoy yourself in Orlando, America's and the world's number one tourist destination. Over 60 million viewer, visitors per year. All right, so if you haven't been to our app, go to the app and download it. It's in the App Store, it's free. It's the Duke Spine Institute app. And there's a lot you can learn from the app. We have great content, really well colored and presentable and in a way that makes it understandable. You can watch live surgeries through the app. And all of our patients that come here, they have their own personalized app uh, results for their body, for their issues. And they can go home and watch, look at the app later and understand what, what it is we diagnose them with. Uh, and then finally, we broadcast live surgeries every week. so. Uh, please feel free to join us in the future for more surgery. All right, that looks like the nerve right there underneath that little bit of fat. And that would be the patient's right L4 nerve root. We're done. Go ahead and type up your questions and I'll do my best to answer them for you in about five minutes. Scope off. Let me show you this incision there's some disc material we're just gonna put some antiseptic down there the antiseptic we use is betadine it's a standard uh, surgical antiseptic let me just see this one try and I'm trying some new stuff. Thanks. Oh, you know what does go down there? I think that goes down there. I think it does go down the hole. I'm pretty sure. If I remember correctly. Yeah. That'd be a good one. Yeah. We could use it before the, the roid. All right. Let me show you all what we've got here. Um, can you see the incision? Yes, you can. I'll put a little bit of pressure. I'm going to call our EBL 3 mil. So we lost 3 milliliters of blood, which is nothing. It's three each milliliter is 20 drops. So you're talking about 60 drops of blood. It's not much. Nothing to get excited about. If this was an open surgery, it would be um, a lot more blood loss. Most spine surgeons lose about... 300 to 500 milliliters of blood per level they fuse or laminectomize. And if you think about 500 milliliters of blood loss for one level of open surgery for most spine surgeons, 500 mils of blood loss is basically 10%, just under 10% of your blood volume. So it's around 10% of the blood volume, maybe a little bit more, 12%. Okay, so you're losing 12% of the blood. That's why they stop at one level. That's why most, one of the reasons most surgeons stop at one level is if they do two levels, they're going to lose 20% of the blood volume. Then you're going to have to transfuse, okay, because you're going to get symptomatic once you lose more than 20%. There's your incision, seven millimeters. We fixed two discs. Both discs were painful. We confirmed that. They were both causing her pain. One was a 10 out of 10 at L45. The other one was an 8 or 9, no, 9 out of 10 at uh, L5S1. So type up your questions and I'll come answer them for you. 
Great job, everyone. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com.
And good morning, I'm Dr. Ara Duke Majin. How's our sound? Yeah, you're good. Oh, we're good. All right. I've got Diego here working the controls, and I got to throw out a, a shout out to Diego. He's done an awesome job with the um, format which you guys are looking at on our broadcast. It's really nice looking and informative, and I'm just so impressed. So, Diego's done an awesome job. All right, the picture we have in the bottom corner. I just want to draw your attention to it. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Diego. They don't want to see my face anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so this picture is an MRI picture of the lumbar spine. And the arrows are pointing to these, um, like these colored zones. And if you look at the red arrows, there's a lot of whitish color where the red arrows are pointing to. Well, that was a muscle. And now it's mostly scar tissue. And this patient had a laminectomy done, not by me, but by somebody else. Okay, we get a lot of people that come here that have had surgery elsewhere and they're just still in pain and then they want me to fix them and I can, I can fix them. But this is one of those patients I saw, I think yesterday in clinic and they had had that laminectomy. And look at the dead muscle. All that white stuff is scar tissue from dead muscle. The reason there's scar tissue is the muscle's dead. The reason the muscle's dead is because they had a laminectomy and the blood supply to the muscle got compromised during surgery. The muscle got retracted too long. It's just like your skin. If you push down on your fingers or your palm with your finger, everything turns white for a second. That's because there's no blood supply going there. So you lose that pink color. You're losing the blood supply in the capillaries. You get that whitish color. That whitish color is no blood flow. If that happens during spine surgery, which it happens almost always for anybody having open back surgeries, you're going to kill your muscles like the red arrows are pointing to. The green arrows are pointing to muscle bundles in the lower back that are normal. And that's what they should normally look like. Okay, so kind of a comparison side by side. All right, let's come back and take our first question after this two level Duke laser disc repair where no muscle was damaged uh, in this patient. Cool. So the first question is, can you do spinal fusions microscopically? Can I do spinal fusions microscopically? What I really think this person's asking is um, the endoscope that I just did, that little tube, it looks like a metal McDonald's shake straw. I think you're asking me, can I do a fusion with that tube? The answer is yes, I can. I can do that. But the actual, if you watch my fusions, all right, and I've done over a thousand lumbar fusions, there's something that I always do, okay? If you look at the spine here, there's something that I always do, and that is I always do an osteotomy. What's an osteotomy? An osteotomy is when I cut through this bone back here called the facet joint and I remove it. I remove the entire facet joint. Why would I remove the facet joint? Because the facet joint gets so arthritic in most people that need fusion that it causes the spine to change its shape so in order to put the spine back where it's supposed to be and fuse it in that perfect shape, you've got to do an osteotomy called the Smith-Peterson osteotomy. If I do the surgery endoscopically, I can't do the Smith-Peterson osteotomy. It's just not possible, okay? Um, so why, why do a fusion microscopically or endoscopically? The real question, why? What are you trying to achieve? What is your goal by doing it microscopically? Because by doing it microscopically, you're going to compromise the quality of the surgery. You're not going to have the same outcome. You're not going to have the same result. You're not going to get the decompression you need. You're not going to get the correction of deformity you need. And you're not going to get the fusion result you want, the best. So to really do the best fusion in the lumbar spine, you need to do it open. And the o lift, the x lift the A-lift, they don't do it right. I would never do those surgeries. I know how to do them, I've been trained to do them, they're easy, but I don't do them. Why? Because they all have disadvantages and they don't provide the best result. To get the best result in a fusion, you have to open these holes up where the nerves are coming out. And everybody that has a fusion has stenosis or narrowing of that hole. So you must open the hole. And the way you open the hole is a laminectomy and then an osteotomy, Smith-Peterson osteotomy, and that will open that hole wide open, and the nerve will be totally decompressed. The other benefit of a Smith-Peterson osteotomy is that you can take a spine that's going like this, 
and you can put it back to its natural curve like that. But you cannot do that without the Smith-Peterson osteotomy. Look what happens to the neural foramen when you correct the deformity and put it into lordosis, which is what you want at the end of a fusion. It narrows that hole. You don't want that hole narrow. That's what pinches the nerve. So you, to, before you can correct the deformity into lordosis, you have to open this hole, get the pressure off the nerves, or the patient's gonna wake up with more leg pain, weakness, numbness in more areas of their leg, and even on both sides. And that's a bad result, okay? The number one reason that people get failed spine fusions is what's called residual stenosis. And residual stenosis means that that hole was not opened up. And the way I open that hole is two things laminectomy, foramenotomy, combined with Smith-Peterson osteotomy. If you watch my surgery on Tuesday, just two days ago, the first one, it was a five-hour surgery, it was massive. Um, that guy had a microdiscectomy done first, two years ago at the Laser Spine Institute. Um, and that microdiscectomy just weakened his spine to the point that he just crumbled. His spine just collapsed and twisted and kyphosed and slipped. And I had to go in there and deal with all that scar tissue and I had to deal with all that deformity and all those compressed nerves. It was horrible, it just took forever. Um, so that surgery is a very complicated version of the fusion, but I did the osteotomies in that surgery and I did the laminectomy and foramenotomy. Why? Because every single fusion I've ever done on people's back, I've always had to treat stenosis and I've always had to treat um, facet arthropathy, hypertrophy and deformity and you can't do that microscopically or endoscopically, okay? If you have a degenerated disc and no deformity and minimal to no stenosis, then yes, I could do a transforaminal endoscopic fusion. I use something called the OptiMesh cage. I was the first one to do it. I did it before it was FD approved. I did it about 2006. So what is that? Um, 15 years ago, I was the first to do it. And I use what are called transfacet pedicle screws, which are these nifty little percutaneous screws that you can put in to lock the facet at the fusion zone together. Long story short, I don't recommend it. I recommend doing my technique for an open lumbar decompression, reconstruction, and fusion if you're going to do a fusion surgery. Know with the peace of mind, the patient's got the very best decompression, realignment, and stabilization surgery. Okay, we have three more. Next question. Will this surgery work for my C6, C7 rupture? Yeah. So our, our viewer is saying, hey, I got a herniated disc in my neck. Will this surgery work for that? The answer is yes. We have an, a version of the Duke Laser Disc Repair done through the front. If you go to PubMed, which is the National Library of Medicine, just Google PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and then you get there and you type in Duke Laser Disc Repair, you'll find some of the papers that we originally published in 2012 and 2013 that the laser surgery I do is safe and effective for herniated discs. You want to avoid fusion, right? You don't want the metal plate on your spine. You don't want that fusion, okay? And the lights are pretty bright. Maybe we need to turn it down a little bit. So he's just giving too much. Um, overexposure. All right, there we go. So there's a fusion right there. And we can actually get into the disc with a tiny little hole. And I can go to the back of the disc and I can repair it with a laser. I just use a toothpick to show you the approach. But yes, there's a Duke laser disc repair for fixing a herniated disc in the neck. We do them all the time. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's outpatient. It literally takes one hour. There's no fusion, no metal. I go right into the back of the disc and with the laser I remove the herniation and clean the annular tear. And then patients go home 45 minutes later. All right. Another viewer on YouTube says he has four herniated discs in his lumbar area. Uh, the more severe one is on L5-S1. Uh, you know, he has tinglings on his left leg. Doesn't know what to do. Yeah. So one of our viewers has four herniated discs. This person has a herniated disc at L5-S1, L45, L34, L23. We see people like this all the time. About 15% of my patients have four herniated discs in their back. We can fix all four of them for you in one hour. Literally, we'd make two cuts on your back, just like you saw, and I would fix two discs with each cut, endoscopically. So the surgery you just watched, we would have to do instead of two discs, we do four. 
and I would expect all your pain to go away completely and permanently uh, in your back and your leg and the numbness and tingling would go away as well. And our last question is, can you help kids with scoliosis? Yeah, can I help kids with scoliosis? That's a great question. Um, yes and no. All right. Yes, I can help if your kid or a kid with scoliosis if they're having back pain. Um, a lot of times the scoliosis is not the cause of the back pain. Like this patient today that we just watched, her MRI uh, and x-ray showed that she had scoliosis at the bottom of her spine, right where we did surgery, L45, L5S1. We did not fix her scoliosis and her pain will be gone because the scoliosis is not the cause of the pain, okay? So if a child has severe idiopathic scoliosis at multiple levels, thoracic and lumbar, that's not surgery that I do. I don't do that surgery. You wanna to go to a pediatric neurosurgeon or pediatric orthopedic spine surgeon, and it's called idiopathic scoliosis. On the other hand, if your child has um, milder form of scoliosis with a disc injury, that's causing their pain, then yes, the laser surgery will work for that pain coming from the herniated disc within the scoliotic, scoliotic part of the spine. Can I do some scoliosis surgery? Yes, but I generally stay away from pediatric um, scoliosis surgery because it's it can be bloody and it's usually best to do it at a hospital where blood transfusions could be done if needed. We don't do any blood transfusions with our surgery because we've never needed it here. Could I do a surgery once in a while as an exception? Yes, I'm perfectly capable of fixing pediatric scoliosis, but I choose not to because I'm so busy fixing herniated discs and spinal stenosis and pinched nerves. Does that mean I'm not capable of doing it? I am capable. I would have to assess the situation and on a case by case make a determination. But I can tell you right now, if it's big, curved, idiopathic scoliosis in a kid, I don't do that. Um, I'm capable of doing it, but I don't do it because we're not in the right setting for it. We don't have the right setting here. We're an outpatient surgery center, Duke Spine Institute. We're not a hospital. And so all of our patients go home within a few hours of surgery. And so could I fix some scoliosis in kids? Yes. It just depends on how severe it is and how much osteotomies need to be done, how much big the incision and muscle dissection, how long the surgery whether or not it's safe to do it here. It's all about safety. So if it's not safe to do it here, I wouldn't do it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, doctor. You're welcome. Thank you all for watching. We'll be back in about 30 minutes with our next Duke Laser Disc Repair. She's gonna be an L45, sorry, an L34 L45. At L34, we're going on the right side. At L45, we're going on the left side. And apparently she has a lot of family members watching as well, including doctors and nurses. So we look forward to broadcasting her surgery. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging